Okay, hello everybody, welcome. Welcome to panel two, everybody, of today's uh, important uh, conference from UK and Changing Europe. I hope you can all hear. I'm uh, Faisal Islamsky's political editor uh, at the moment. But um, we um, uh, are all here, obviously, to have a, an important academic discussion uh, and apply that uh, stellar research uh, to the public understanding uh, and your understanding. So the issue for panel two is immigration, as you can see. What do people want? Uh, and our panel, uh, I'll just quickly introduce them all before taking them five or six minutes to express their take on all of this issue. We have Rob Ford, Manchester Univ University professor, who will be presenting research showing a shifting national debate on immigration and what he says is a softening of attitudes. Uh, we have Sunder Katwala of British Future Think Tank. He'll be presenting findings from the National Conversation, which showed that most people are balancers when it comes to immigration, appreciating both its costs and its benefits. Uh, Bobby Duffy will be setting out how perceptions on immigration on its scale and its social and economic impact do not necessarily match reality and why that might be. And Heather Rolf will be presenting research examining the potential economic impact of immigration policy post-Brexit. Uh, um, worth noting, of course, that it had already been planned to start the passage of the Immigration Bill through the Commons. That had to be delayed because of the Commons shenanigans. But anyway, let's go to, uh, I think we're starting with Rob. Rob. Uh, thanks, um, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit. Uh, I haven't got slides, which is very unusual for me, because the last UK and a Changing Europe event I came to, I had slides and no one else did. So I concluded that they're not necessary. And then the first panel, everyone had slides. So... Um, you know, it seems there's shenanigans here too. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, one of the big changes in the past two years since Brexit that has really surprised me as someone who's been researching attitudes on immigration for the best part of 15 years, which is a really quite large and sustained positive shift in views about immigration um, since the EU referendum uh, vote. Now, this takes a number of forms. Uh, the first is that the salience of the issue, the, the share of the public that rate it as one of the top issues on the agenda, has fallen very sharply indeed. Uh, it was around 40 to 45% at the time of the EU referendum vote. It's now under 20% on Ipsos Mori's long-running question, which is the lowest it's been since 2001. Um, when we were debating Tony Blair's re-election is the last time that immigration was as lacking in salience uh, as it is right now. Now, when I put out this kind of research, one of the first sceptical responses I tend to get when saying that is, oh, well, the only reason that's happened is because everyone's just folded it in to the broader Brexit issue and actually they care about it just as much. And there's some evidence for that, but I don't think it's the whole story. Uh, you also get the argument that, that all that's happened is that media coverage of the issue has dropped off. And that's also very true, in fact, in terms of the number of headline negative stories about immigration. They completely fell off a cliff uh, after 2016. But again, I don't think it's the whole story because you run into the problem of the chicken and the egg. Uh, do newspapers run stories on immigration because it's salient or is it salient because newspapers run stories uh, on it? But it's a little bit of each normally. Um, another reason why I don't think this is just about um, media or just about a change of the debate to being Brexit with immigration in brackets is because when you look at what people think about the impacts of immigration, you see the same kind of shift. So the share of the public who say that immigration is good for the economy has risen sharply. The share of people who think that immigration is good and a positive thing for the national culture has risen sharply. Both of those questions are asked regularly by the British election study. Other academic studies looking at this time period have found exactly the same thing. So it's quite a robust shift. Um, we also see evidence on the specific question, which is right at the heart of much of the Brexit debate. Theresa May has always made immigration control one of her red lines because she says that's what um, the Leave voters uh, mandated her to deliver. Well, the best question we have getting at that difficult trade-off is asking people whether or not they think it's more important to prioritise 
control of immigration, or more important, to prioritise access to the single uh, market. Um, and researchers have looked at that question at repeated time points uh, using uh, the British Social Attitudes Internet Panel data. And there, again, we see a sustained shift towards prioritising single market access over prioritising immigration control. So while that may still be a red line for Theresa May, it's becoming a much blurrier, pinker line for the public as a whole. In fact, if anything, the share of people who see the opposite position as being the red line is rising. So if you are a soft Brexiteer, then your argument could very well be, well, it's true that when we had the vote, the public did seem to want immigration control as a priority. However, things have really moved on since then, and there seems to be a lot more appreciation of the need for access to the single market. Uh, as yet, though, I haven't seen many in Parliament who seem aware of this public opinion data. So those of you who know members of Parliament, do feel free to disseminate the research. Um, now, that's, the, that's what I've found. Um, after the, I just want to talk briefly about what I think this may all mean for immigration politics going forward. The first thing is I think this is likely to be a lasting shift in sentiment and a lasting shift in the politics of immigration, even if we end up with a soft Brexit that means we still have free movement. One reason for that is the demographic and economic shifts in Central and Eastern Europe mean that migration on the scale of what we saw from 2004 to 14 is just unlikely to be repeated. Something that isn't very well understood in Britain, but is something I'm aware of because I have Polish in-laws, is that there was a big bulge of Poles in the 20s, right at the time when Poland joined in 2004, which was the product of a baby boom that happened uh, during the period of military um, curve in Poland in the early 1980s. <laughs> you, you seem to have all anticipated where I'm going with that point. But it's, it's there in the data. Now, that, that boom has now receded. Uh, and indeed, just in the last two sets of Office for National Statistics migration data, we see for the first time that net migration from Poland is now negative. There are more people going to Poland from Britain than there are coming from Poland. Uh, we're also seeing that the relative wages in Central and Eastern Europe and Britain is a much narrower gap now than there was before. So that pull factor is also reduced. Um, we are also likely to see, and I think uh, Heather will be talking about it, a shift towards a more skill-biased system of migration. That tends to line up better with um, public preferences and we're also seeing a continuing demographic shift here in Britain, whereby the groups who are most sceptical uh, about migration and most negative about its effects, which tends to be older white voters with fewer formal educational qualifications, that group steadily declines in size over time. So when, even when the immigration debate re-arises, the relative balance of groups in the electorate will be different, and the most vocally sceptical group about migration will be smaller. Um, and what I think all of this points to is that we may well revert to an older model of the politics of immigration that was prevalent before the early 2000s. Since the early 2000s, we've been in a situation where immigration is like a constant in our political debate. It's always there, always dividing things, always making politicians of both parties anxious, always right at the top of the Ipsos Mori rankings of issues. If you look at immigration for the 30 or 40 years prior to that, it's a very different kind of issue. It's more like crime or terrorism, that you get these big spikes of attention to it, but they're relatively brief uh, in response to particular crises, things like the Kenyan Asians crisis, the Ugandan Asians crisis, um, the uh, riots in the early 1980s. Um, I think that immigration going forward may end up being more like that because although we will have a situation where there's a sort of lower equilibrium level of attention to the issue, the potential for external events to disrupt that equilibrium will still be there. We will still have refugee crises. We will still have wars out there in the world. There'll be things that will bring this back onto the agenda. Um, but all that said, that seems to be a relatively positive, optimistic message about immigration and immigration politics. There are also some reasons for caution, uh, the most important of which is, though I said that the migration sceptic group in the electorate is declining, that decline is slow and the group is still very large. And they have an established tendency to do things politically that the politicians of either party aren't particularly keen on or happy with. They voted for UKIP in very large numbers in 2015. They voted for Brexit 
it in the face of uh, considerable um, scepticism from mainstream party elites in 2016. Their levels of allegiance to mainstream parties are very low. Their level of distrust in mainstream politics is very high. So that's still a kind of radical element in the electorate that could prove disruptive again if something uh, uh, agitates it and, and works it up. A second issue is that immigration now is different perhaps to, to the past because it's become a very powerful symbol in the centre of a much broader set of identity and value conflicts which the speakers on the first panel uh, were talking about a lot. It's no longer just about immigration in itself, it's about what immigration symbolises about the kind of Britain that you want uh, to live in, the kind of Britishness that you see as important. And that kind of argument won't go away, even if the specifics of immigration recede from the agenda uh, a little bit. Uh, so what I think we will have is perhaps a more normal kind of discussion about immigration than we've had for a long time, but still with this potential for it to get everybody worked up um, quite quickly. Um, and that's the point I'll finish on. Hey, Rob, just a quick point, point of clarification. To what yeah. extent is uh, the decline in sterling driving that... Um, uh, what you said about the Polish net migration and things like that. How, how has that just been a, a key and core economic driver in terms of the returns to uh, immigrating into the UK? I think it's, it's an important one and, and, and often missed because that there is a kind of predominant narrative that what's happened is that Central Europeans feel that they're no longer welcome here and therefore they're all leaving. Um, whereas, in fact, the sort of level of migration was falling off even before the referendum and has fall off, fallen off at an accelerating rate since. And, you know, the, the much sort of more banal explanation of the wages are just not as good, mm. I think, is a big driver of that as well, yeah. Mm. Okay, very helpful. Um, I think we're going... Bobby now, yep, Bobby. Great, thank you very much, uh, great to be here. And uh, thanks to Rob for that, that was a great overview of uh, the attitudinal data, I think, uh, and which I agree with uh, in terms of the trends. I guess the, the one qualification that I always bear in mind with those type of salience measures, in particular the immigration measure, is there is an element of zero-sum game to them that, that does, doesn't require you to wrap it into, to say it's wrapped into... Uh, Brexit concern. It just some issues push other issues out, and you see that with the economy a lot. So when the economy went wrong in 2008, nine immigration concern tended to go down, but it hadn't really gone away. It had just been suppressed by that kind of zero-sum nature of those salience questions. And all that points to is, I think, it, is it can change quickly again afterwards. The fundamentals, as Rob says, are, are moving in a particular direction, but it does shift around quite quickly. But that's not what I want to focus on. I want to focus on uh, three quick points, uh, mostly about misperceptions and inconsistencies. So the first one, when we're thinking about the title of the, the, the session, what do people uh, want from immigration? First thing to bear in mind is that what people say they want on immigration is based on very, very wrong views of the realities of immigration. And it's just, we just need to register app. So you can take a number of different aspects of that. So they guess that immigration is twice its actual level overall immigration is twice its actual level, the average across uh, the whole population. They think, uh, or we think, EU immigration is three times its natural, uh, its actual level. When we've got a mental image of immigration in mind, uh, we massively overweight asylum seekers and refugees relative to the proportion that, that are made up of the immigrant population. We have a very wrong mental image of it. And then we think so many of the impacts are more negative than they really are. So three quarters of Leave supporters think that EU immigration increases increases crime when the best available evidence suggests that there's no relationship between the two things. And that's kind of reflected in, uh, we think that uh, the prison population, the, the immigrants make up three times as much of the prison population as they actually do, which is a really direct measure of how we think that crime is connection. Only 29% of the public think e EU immigrants contribute more in tax than they take in services and benefits. When that is the case, 4.7 billion according to the MAC report, is contributed more than is taken out by EU immigrants. Uh, and they think that, it, that uh, the majority think that it decreases the quality of health services in the UK, when, when again, the MAC evidence says that it actually increases through contribution and, and workforce effects. So massive misperceptions about the impact of immigration when we're thinking about how people making judgments about what they want. But from that, it's really important not to jump to the conclusion that if you could just change these misperceptions, we would change views and we would want what people want. That kind of simple myth-busting 
uh, approach to this is you just need to educate people and give them the information in this and then they will change their views. Missy is a large part of the explanation for people's misperceptions because they are largely emotional, uh, partly, large part of it is emotional and tied into other things as the, the first panel has said about identity issues. This cause and effect between misperceptions and uh, attitudes run in both directions. So we overestimate what we worry about as much as worrying about what we overestimate. It's really important to be aware of that. And so you need to be really wary of things like the Stephen Fry video that people may have seen, which got a lot of coverage and positivity towards it, which was effectively a very simple myth-busting approach, um, which did lay out some of these errors in people's misperceptions. But effectively, it really just is talking to the converted and does nothing to address uh, the issues and the real concerns that other people have within the population. Um, but my second point is, it's not just about misperceptions. People are very inconsistent and nuanced in their views. So there is, there's a large part of nuance in people's attitudes. Taking an overall attitude to immigration is really tough to do, particularly when you're thinking about what people want as a result. So people have very different views depending on skills levels, origin of the uh, immigrants, the type of immigration we're talking about, many, many different factors. Uh, it changes people's perceptions and then what they want done as a result. Um, it, more much more nuanced than you would think when you look at the coverage of attitudinal data, which is just this monolithic view of immigration as a whole, when it's actually, not surprising, very diverse views because it's such a massive, diverse uh, population that we're talking about. So that means we have to be really careful when we're interpreting that. Um, but it's not, I would argue, it's not just that nuance or balance of trade-offs between things. It isn't just that people have a set, settled view of different immigrant populations and different things. It's probably because, as well, that people have internal inconsistencies on this. It reminds me a bit of, we used to do lots of research on people's views of uh, service variation in local areas and the postcode lottery. And you could get people to agree, majorities of people to agree, that they want tailored services. It makes perfect sense to have tailored services for local areas because different uh, needs in different areas and get the same people to agree that we need the services to be exactly the same everywhere because that's the fair thing to do. So we do have this internal dichotomies in our heads. We, can, we have got fractured views where we have separate things. So you just need to be aware, particularly when you're asking people uh, what to do. So in, in an immigration uh, context, you can get majorities of people to agree that in the same study that both immigrants take jobs from uh, native people and they also create jobs uh, for native people. And it's just because the framing of the question, the way people are, are, are encouraged to think about it, means that people have a different mental image of the immigrants that they are thinking of. So it's kind of that idea of inconsistency as well as nuance, really important. Final point, though, is that uh, I talk a lot about misperceptions and how people are wrong about different stuff uh, and that they have uh, contradictions. And that is not at all saying that people are too dumb or inconsistent to tell us uh, what they want on this or that they shouldn't be involved in these sorts of decision making. In fact, it's really the opposite in that. I mean, uh, these types of issues about inconsistencies and emotional reactions mean that we need more active engagement of the public in these types of things and trust them to get to grips with these things through more deliberative approaches, uh, like citizen assemblies or deliberative polling or different sorts of deliberative methods, which we use very poorly and unevenly in this country. And I've seen many of these exercises close up on complex and emotional issues where people do engage with experts, with the evidence, with other people with different sorts of views and have proper discussions about these types of things. They don't flip their whole world view when you're talking about it with them, uh, but it does actually lead to a better discussion, better decisions as a result of it. Some are raising the possibility of a citizens' assembly on Brexit. I think that's an incredibly tough uh, thing to do. It could be the death of deliberative approaches in the UK, not the beginning, if we threw a citizen assembly at uh, settling Brexit for us. Uh, but for the future, and specifically for this question... Uh, on what the people want from immigration, I think we should be making more of you, uh, more use of these. Uh, we need to trust people more with decisions, not less. Thank you. Um, is there, Bobby, any evidence that people weigh up? Um, and we'll have a larger discussion about this, but, but, but just to you, because obviously freedom of movement is a two-way street. Do people actually weigh that up, or is it different people that use the freedoms outwards than complain about them inwards? Uh, yes, I think the more the latter than the, the former. It is uh, 
relatively small proportions of the population that benefit from that freedom of movement to, to a large enough degree that it outweighs their concerns for other things. But this is probably a perfect lead into some of Sunder's point. Okay, actually. go on. Now, we'll, we'll address that point more generally later, but, but to, to, uh, tell us your uh, research, Sunder. Great. Well, thanks, thanks very much. It's good to, it's good to be here. Um, British Futures, a non-partisan independent think tank, but we engage the public on divisive and polarising issues like immigration integration identities. I've got some evidence to present from that. I think this panel is interesting because the, the politics of immigration to a very large extent are the politics of claims about public opinion about immigration. Public opinion really matters and what politicians and the media think it is. It's about the legitimacy of giving people what they want and it's also sometimes about the illegitimacy of giving people what they want. You shouldn't pander to people that are misinformed or what if they're being xenophobic or racist or show some leadership and tell them about the economy. So what people think about immigration is really, is really, is really central. I think the rise in the salience of immigration always gets a lot of headlines. And it, in a way, there's a possibility the fall in the salience of immigration might not be noticed. And so politicians might be responding to the politics of 2005 or 2014 when something's changed. This is very important. There's a paradox, I think, between between the panel you listen to and this panel, because um, we're very divided and polarised. People feel that. We're more polarised on Brexit than we were at the time of the referendum. And we seem less polarised about immigration. Um, still pretty polarised, but also the priority of the issue has gone down. The attitudes have shifted in a positive way among people who are positive and among people who are negative. So. Um, we wouldn't have had the referendum without the politics of immigration after 2004. That 2012 to 2016 pressure on David Cameron was very much about the rise of UKIP on immigration. We wouldn't have had the 52% result without that sense that governments had dropped the ball and lost people's confidence. And yet afterwards, immigration has diminished in importance and other things are polarising the same people. So that's quite, that's quite an interesting complication about it. To dig into that, we held uh, the National Conversation on Immigration. We think it's the largest public engagement exercise on immigration in this country or anywhere or on any issue in this country. And we did four things. This is British Future and Hope Not Hate. And it was an input into the Home Affairs Select Committee, which were asking the question, can we find common ground on this polarising issue. Uh, we travelled 16,000 miles between uh, spring 2017 and spring 2018. So we went to 60 different towns and cities around the UK. We went to the Shetland Islands, we went to Penzance, we went to Wolverhampton. There's not a corner of the map that we didn't you know, populate <laughs> with, a, with a dot. Five, five places in every uh, nation and re region. We met stakeholders there, uh, business, universities, local councils who work on it. And we had 10 representative members of the public recruited to be pretty representative of Merthyr Tidville or Grimsby or Hammersmith or Edinburgh or wherever you were. And we did two other things. We left a, an online survey open uh, for the whole year we were doing it promoted it in these places and promoted it online and when we could. Um, and we did a representative poll just to check all of the other things. So they're, they're my elements. Um, I agree with what's been said by so far. We found out that most people are balancers seeing pressures and gains, except on the internet. Most people are not balancers on the internet. And the graph in the, graph in the report uh, from this, I think, I think this is not just the politics of immigration, this is politics of Brexit. Everywhere we went as a warm-up question, we always said to people, give me a, give me a score, one to ten. How good or bad has immigration been to Britain? Ten best things since sliced bread. For Britain and your local community, ten if it's the best thing ever, one if it's ruined your country, give me a score. The most popular answers are five and six. Five in England, six in Scotland... Six if you're British Asian, five if you're white British. A lot of, you know, people moving around between the fours, five, sixes and sevens. On the internet, uh, a majority of participants chose one or ten. Um, uh, those two groups, half of the online sample, 10,000 people online, and we saw people sharing it with other people. The Refugees Welcome Movement is sharing it. Hope Not Hate are sharing it. People who hate Hope Not Hate are sharing it. <laughs> we saw exactly why it, was, why it was happening. And so we ended up with this, with this fascinating, fascinating, fascinating point where this highly polarised online sample, where there was still some common ground actually on some things, and this, this, this group of people, and then the middle 70% of people were missing from the online survey. They had about 10% of worked, the online voice. Well, you, you, you don't stay in the discussion. You, you know, you don't... So, so that, the, 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 the contrast between actual public opinion and the self-selecting sample, and I think this is the broader politics of Brexit. So in our, in our citizens' groups, you couldn't tell 
the Remainers from the Leavers lots of the time until they told you who they didn't trust now after the campaign on Brexit. But while they were discussing how we handle immigration and frustrated it was so high, um, I've got low trust in government, um, uh, I think polls work hard and do a lot of good things, you know, we need to get it right. That pragmatism was just a shared conversation until people directly touched on the referendum. So we actually found there was a lot of consensus on most things except the immigration rules after Brexit about the European Union. There was a lot more consensus on refugee immigration, skilled migration, student migration, all the other things there was a consensus on. That seemed to be getting, that seemed to be getting harder. The white paper is broadly where the public are on lots and lots of things, except when it prefers temporary migration. The public do not prefer temporary migration. They don't think the government's got a grip. They don't think it's fair to migrants. They don't think it's good for integration. So the government's tried to do something that's good for business uh, and will cheer up the public. If you're worried about the pace of change, next last year's migrant neighbour being different to next year's migrant neighbour, rather than someone who stays for three years and is with you at the school gate, is not what makes you feel better about the pace of change. Um, so we found a lot of things, I think, that I was um, expecting to hear, having done five years on public attitudes, but we found two or three things that, that surprised me uh, a bit or clarified uh, things. I think these were, these were very decent conversations. People were policing their prejudice norms quite a lot, but there was still a lot of an casual anti-Muslim prejudice there that people didn't realise was prejudiced, in a way, because uh, they were stereotyping a group. How little policy knowledge people had was really interesting. People have heard of two things about immigration. They've heard of the Australian point system. It's code for a system that manages immigration. It's also code for a system that lets people in. The reason people have heard of the Australian point system is that two million British-born people live in Australia. And so most people have got someone in their extended family who's been through that. That's your main experience. Um, and they've heard of the rule about, um, or the idea that you could claim in the first country you came to if you were a refugee. Those are the two bits of policy knowledge that most people have. So we asked people, who's heard of the net migration target? About two out of ten people have heard of the net migration target. Someone will then say it's meant to be tens of thousands, they always miss it, what are they doing? If you've heard of it, it has not increased your trust in government. But, 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 but the idea that it's a totemic thing, that if you changed it, people go mad, well, they haven't actually heard of it. They know that government's meant to have reduced immigration a bit and isn't doing it and so on, but, but they haven't heard of that. So... That's interesting, because politicians are always coming up with apprenticeship levies or migration impacts funds or, or tell them about the existing rules and that we'll manage to achieve freedom of movement like they do in Belgium. People will never hear of this. You're just completely on the wrong part. People have got clear views about what they think policy needs to do, but they don't hear about micro policies. Another quite interesting, surprising thing, just how much the local matters. So these national views are quite mixed. Almost everyone everywhere really likes student immigration. It was very unpopular in Dumfries, but it was popular in 59 other places in Britain. Sorry, Dumfries. The rest of Scotland, it was, it was popular. Uh, people in Scotland are more likely to think that international students might be in competition with Scottish students. They don't think that in England and Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, um, but, but we heard very, very, very little about jobs and wages, pressure on jobs and wages. It just didn't come up almost anywhere apart or compared to pressure on public services. And then sometimes it really did. In the East Midlands, it was a dominant theme in Northampton and Chesterfield. And as soon as people talked about it, you knew whose fault that was. It was the fault of Sports Direct and Amazon that specific local employers had such practices and such reputations. They created a microclimate of immigration around Chesterfield, Mansfield and Bolsover that is a completely different conversation from the rest of the country because that idea that if you give businesses what they want, they will exploit people. On the other hand, very few people took the trade-off for uh, free movement. When people did it, they did it at the same time as dismissing predictions about national GDP. They told us a very, very local story. So the trade-off of taking free movement for the single market was something that people wanted in Hammersmith and Edinburgh just about, and then in Macclesfield and Knowsley. And in Knowsley, that was about cars, and in Macclesfield, that was about pharmaceuticals in this place creating jobs here, even while people saying they'd never believe people. So the local salience of things not being handled or being handled was absolutely dominant to all of these national debates, and I think politicians have missed that. That leads me just to end on this point about the trade-off. The trade-off has been sort of 40-40 for ages and ages, and now it's swung quite heavily to immigration doesn't matter as well. That doesn't mean that people know about the trade-off, it doesn't mean that people think about the trade-off, and it doesn't mean they've changed their minds about the trade-off or that they like it. It just means that they're less concerned about immigration than they were. Previous data has shown that two-thirds of people don't like it. So if we prove there is a trade-off, people think that shows the inflexibility of the rules of the European Union and so on. So the trade-off debate is actually quite interesting because you're changing the subject 
which is what the Remain campaign actually got wrong by saying that really matters. We've been talking about how it really matters. Can I just say right at the end of this conversation, something else is always going to matter more, isn't it? The City of London has got strong views. You're actually saying, in the end, trade this in. If you think the trade-off is a real policy thing in the negotiation, you've actually got to explain why the immigration policy you would have is a good immigration policy that's fair to people who want to work, that manages it well, rather than saying, let's do it for some other reason. I was at a group in Guildford, Yvette Cooper came to this one, and she asked the question right at the end. A very soft Remain voting panel, mainly, because it's Guildford, 56% Remain. Um, and we asked the question right at the end, what if it comes down to the economy and migration, which would you prioritise? And they all said the economy. And so we said, so does that mean you'll take the trade-off free movement for the economy. And they'd all said, we should take people who want to work, we should take people who've come to work for a job. That was their preference for policy. And two minutes later, they'd left the European Union without a deal because there has to be a deal in the end. So let's call their bluff in the poker game. The, the whole question of a trade-off triggered a poker divorce negotiation where they thought you should call the other side's bluff, even though they would have taken the content of the immigration offer you could have made in the trade-off. So I don't think we know that people think about the trade-off. We didn't hear about it. We found six groups out of six who took it. People might take a very soft immigration policy, but they won't take it because something matters more than immigration. They'll take it because you made the case for the immigration policy that is part of that package. So uh, just a, a quick one uh, for you, Sander. Um, the latest migration figures, though, show an uptick in non-EU migration, yep. decline in EU migration. Uh, has anyone... Are people noticing that? Does that affect people's attitudes? Is, is it consistent with the Brexit vote? Um, people, people won't notice it. People won't notice it. I mean, if net migration was 100,000, how would you notice that in Wolverhampton mm. if the flow changed? Um, people, people have a sense of the pace of change. Um, the, the, the rise, I mean, people have got three images of immigration. They've got immigration for the NHS, which is brilliant and sometimes restaurants. They've got hard-working Poles who are good people, but the government didn't handle it well. And they've got refugees and asylum seekers where we should be empathetic to, but I don't know if we've got a grip on the situation. If the non-EU immigration that's coming in is student and skilled migration, and people just don't think about family migration, I mean, they might in other contexts if something happened, um, is the type of migration they want. So, again, the one reason people think the government hasn't got a grip is when the government, because of its target, then says NHS trust can't get doctors. And then people are like, well, why are they giving us that? I mean, we want them to control immigration sensibly. Why do they think we're bonkers? They must be bonkers. And so, so that sort of, it was always more about EU and the non-EU. We found it harder to get people to talk about non-EU immigration. They had the perception it was controlled and they had less to say about it unless they'd worked in it. People, people from ethnic minority backgrounds had a feeling it was quite heavily controlled and could be unfair in that it, there were lots of hoops. Everyone else were glad they were some hoops. So again, if you, if you make the system very flexible, people will say, well, it's good, it's flexible for business. Is there control? Are there criminal checks? So. Okay, thanks, Under. Heather. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm really pleased to be here with these wonderful experts um, on the panel. So I want to approach things from a slightly different perspective, which is... Um, what, what does it look like the public is going to get from immigration? And is that what they seem to want? Um, and drawing on work that we've done at, at NISA, also uh, work by um, Bobby, um, Rob and, and Sunder. So as Rob said, the share of um, the public naming, con naming immigration as a top priority has fallen consistently um, since since the Brexit vote and attitudes are becoming um, more positive. But meanwhile, uh, policy has been drawn up um, in the form of the immigration white paper, um, which claims to address public concerns. I think uh, James said that um, this morning. And in the, in, in the introduction to the white paper, Theresa May states uh, that it begins the process of delivering an immigration system truly undermined truly underpinned, not undermined, truly underpinned uh, by public support. And this follows, as I said, the report of the Migration Advisory Committee on the impact of EU migration, but many of its proposals are actually formulated in relation to public attitudes, or at least how public attitudes are understood. And much of its proposals are based on two principles, which appear very strongly in public debate, as we've heard this morning, about immigration, and that's control on the one hand and skills, skills on the other to replace um, free movement for work and to introduce what the white paper calls a single skills-based system which would effectively end low-skilled migration. That, at least, is, is what the 
white paper suggest should happen. Um, so I want to briefly describe um, its provisions, uh, looking at the issues of skills, and looking at then whether the proposals seem to address public concerns. And here I'm going to draw on research that we've done with the public in focus groups, which every time I hear Sunder speak, I'm, I'm struck by how similar his findings are to ours. But ours were in one particular area of the UK, sitting born in Kent, and they were 12 fo focus groups. where So we kind of drilled down into one area, whereas um, Sunder and British Future obviously he went, went all over the country and did, did a larger number. But essentially, I think our findings are, are very similar, strikingly similar. So what does the white paper say in relation to control? Well, first of all, um, it proposes an end of free movement, no change in visas for travel, um, but the extension of visas required currently for people outside the EU um, to EU citizens, and those already here will obviously have to have skills state, um, settled status uh, to stay beyond the transition. And so there's a lot in the white paper about control, <clears throat> about new digital systems, applications from outside the EU, fee payments, and a lot about information. Enforcement. And I think a lot of the issues around control will depend very much on how it actually is enforced. And then in terms of public trust, how it's actually seen to be controlling um, immigration. But essentially, it brings control um, over EU migration into a new immigration system. So in relation to skills, I think it's, it's much more interesting and much, much more potentially of, of, of a change because it does include provision only for skilled migration. And that's defined in terms of qualification level, which is a little bit lower than it is at present. So it incorporates um, NVQ level three um, rather than um, graduate level. Um, and at the moment, with a proposed salary threshold with 30,000. And as many people have pointed out, that would effectively exclude many skilled jobs um, in, in the health sector, uh, for example, in teaching, um, uh, even junior doctors. So a whole range of jobs would be excluded from that. But that is out um, for consultation, or it will be out um, for consultation um, at some point, and we don't know when. And on, on the skills angle, individuals will have to get clearance before entry and be sponsored by an employer so they can't come over here. No preference will be given to EU citizens, but if you look at the, the detail of what's suggested in the white paper, they talk about individuals from trusted, um, from low-risk countries being potentially able to transfer from um, a tourist type visa to um, to a work visa and that could mean that could be a route in for for EU citizens there it, it sounds as if they could they could achieve priority so the, but the the white paper specifically makes no provision for lower skilled migration except for a seasonal agricultural worker scheme um, and that will be trialed and there's also a proposed extension of the current youth mobility scheme. Um, which operates for various countries, and that would be extended to these so-called low-risk countries, uh, for which we don't exactly know who they are. So the only real provision otherwise for low-skilled workers is a system of 12 months um, low-skilled visas, which is called a transitional arrangement. So it's not even a commitment to these, um, to these visas um, in, in the long term. And that will be subject to restriction by nationality, duration, possibly numbers, we don't know, and as I said, for and, and again for low risk countries with whom the UK negotiates an agreement. And so the restrictions are very deliberately presented as a response to public opinion. Um, and in explaining the transitional um, short-term route, the report says, the MAC has said there should be no dedicated route for unskilled labour and we do not intend to open one. And then they say, this is consistent. This is the quote that James said this morning, the same one. This is consistent with the public's view that we should be attracting the brightest and best to come to the UK and that lower skilled labour may have depressed wages or stifled innovation in our economy. It kind of... It, it, it implies that that's a finding of the MAC report, which it certainly wasn't. Um, but because the MAC recommended cutting low-skilled migra migration purely on fiscal grounds, that it was, they considered um, that uh, lower-skilled migrants were not making the, 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 the same um, uh, contributions to the economy as, as, as lower-skilled. And I mean, you could actually argue that that was a flawed analysis of why you might actually need low-skilled migration. But in any case, um, uh, it, it's somewhat of a misre misrepresentation. But if you look at surveys and opinion polls, they do consistently find that the public does more strongly support high-skilled migration. 
and, and some even support an increase in, in higher skilled migration. And in contrast, the same surveys um, show much less support for low skilled migration. But skill is a very slippery concept. And um, you can't always be sure that people may mean the same thing by this. And anyone who's studied skills and the concept knows that that's the case. Um, and, it's an, and, and I think it's, this, is an issue, this is an area on which qualitative research can really add value. So the related issues of control and skill were strong themes in the focus group research that we carried out um, last year in Sittingbourne, where we, uh, we included both leavers and remainers, and, um, and the same issues obviously did um, arise in the focus groups that British Future did. So for our research, we surveyed um, people at various points um, in the research before and after the focus groups. And when they were surveyed, a majority, like 57%, said they wanted the government to use Brexit as an opportunity to cut down on the quantity of EU migration. And I think that's consistent with other research. But whenever it came up in the focus groups, it was very much framed in terms of controls. And that was about ensuring the perceived quality um, of migrants rather than the quantity. And a high, a high quality migrant was someone who, A, comes here to work, is a net contributor to the public purse, who doesn't commit crimes, and who doesn't come over here to claim benefits. And I think, as, as Bobby has said, you know, people are, are very misinformed about immigration, and actually quite a high proportion of the public, I think it's about 25%, if they're given the option, I think Rob's written about this, um, if they're given the option how, do, about that includes the proportion of people who come over here to claim benefits, I think about a quarter of the public uh, believe that that's a major driver of, of immigration. Um, so, and in line with survey findings, um, our, our survey before the focus groups found that significantly more, more participants, that's 86%, um, report state, they said that highly skilled migration is good to the UK, compared with low skilled migration, about 31%. That's still quite high. Um, but when we discussed the issue in, in focus groups, participants did regularly acknowledge that low skilled migration or low skilled migrants play a very important role meeting labour shortages in sectors such as social care, sectors which are supported by the public, but also in less worthy jobs like construction, fruit picking. This is Kent, so a lot of, a lot of participants had direct experience of fruit picking themselves or their families had. And also they recognised that migrants were carrying out jobs which were very unattractive to British people. So some argued that British people ought to be forced into low-skilled work rather than claim benefits, and, um, but most saw a need for migrants in low-skilled work, and they did see negative consequences of stopping it altogether. So the white paper is a series of proposals which will take some time to become policy, um, and the provisions within the white paper do allow for a review of various aspects of the proposal, such as uh, the SOARS, the Seasonal Agricultural Workers Scheme, is going to be trialled, and there's going to be an employer consul consultation on the salary threshold um, for skilled visas, but there's no plans for a public consultation until 2025. Um, yet, the policy, if it's based on um, what the public wants, it will um, almost certainly damage businesses and the economy, and it's based on a series of um, assumptions about public attitudes, which are either themselves inaccurate um, or or actually have changed since, since the public vote. So you have to take into account that the public may not feel as strongly about these things as uh, the government seems to think there should be. So my conclusion with, with the others, I mean, particularly um, what, what Sondra says, that there does need to be more of a conversation, some kind of um, deliberative polling or some kind of um, series of events where migration is discussed, where people are presented with the facts in a non in a way that doesn't that doesn't amount to myth busting. I think another very constructive step would be to have some kind of to have I don't know exactly what this would look like, uh, but some kind of way in which employers and the public could be brought together so that there could be an open discussion between employers who obviously are the main beneficiaries of migration, particularly those called migration, and 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 with with the public. So I shall. And on that note. Right, thanks, Heather. Um, I mean, what I'm, I'm intrigued. There was a bit of a sort of giggle uh, when you mentioned that people would be, uh, to replace the low skill migration, would be forced to work instead of claiming benefits. Hmm. But actually, I'm quite intrigued by that because it speaks to something uh, sort of wider, which is 
do people think through the full consequences of their attitude to migration, how it might impact on them, or do they believe it? So, for example, are there people who may be in receipt or imminently in receipt of social care who think about, we don't want, my, you know, social care migration? You know, do they think, well, I might not have a social worker? Do they care? Do they, I mean, is there any evidence of that? Or are some of the people who may have to do the low-skilled work thinking that might be me that has to do that? I think both. Does that affect yeah. people's opinions? I mean, I, I, I'm, very, I'm very interested in... No, absolutely. I think both. Um, so I think we had a fair number of people who were claiming benefits or, or had done, or people in their family who had, and um, they felt... Um, they didn't want to go into low-skilled work. They certainly did not want their kids to go into low-skilled work. And this is where I find um, I'm always a bit confused, really, why the public supports high-skilled migration um, more than low-skilled. So you think they would want those high-skilled jobs and they wouldn't actually be wanting to do the low-skilled jobs. But they definitely don't want their kids to do low-skilled work and they want the quality of jobs to be improved. But equally, I don't think they were blaming migrants for the low quality of jobs but that they were... those people want low-skilled workers to do those jobs as well? Did they want low-skilled low British workers? Uh, no, low, well, did they want, who did they want to do the jobs? I think they were quite happy for migrants to do them. In ah, right, cases. OK, that's right, the point. right. No, they, right, they, okay, were, fine, they were quite happy. Sorry, they that's absolutely I understood, in particular with, with fruit picking, which a lot of them had done. And they'd done, them in, they'd done it in the past, they'd done it for cash in hand, and now they realised it was all kind of regulated, it was very low pay, very hard work. They absolutely understood, and I think they were quite happy to hand that, uh, that, that work over to migrants. The same with, with other work, where there were skill shortages... On your first point about um, about social care, definitely that they felt that there should be migrants in social care and um, in the health service, and th uh, those were places where they did come across face-to-face -face migrant yeah. workers. Because the other thing um, is that the migrant and the non-migrant labour force is often quite segregated, so that people don't necessarily have experience with working with migrants at work and have that see their economic contribution. Well, one last piece of clarification, then we'll throw this whole line of questioning over, open to everybody. So does, do people see, so we've talked about the actual impact, so there has been a decline, and now we're talking like net migration to Poland. Yeah. Do people s see pressures in social care or in low-skilled uh, workforces now? Is anybody, are people worried about it, or everyone think it'll be fine, we'll force <coughs> people to do the work? Um, I think they 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 weren't envisaging that um, Brexit would result in an end to migration. There were some people, very hardline, very hardline leavers, very anti-immigration, who wanted immigration stops. But actually, that was really unusual. I think the overwhelming view would be that we should probably let fewer people in, but they should be in jobs which are economically, socially socially useful. So I think they, they, they would be expecting migration to continue post-Brexit. I think as other people said, they'd have okay. no way of knowing whether the number... Well, let's let other people pick this up. I guess my, there's a paradox here, which I still, I'm just still a little bit confused by, which is that if people want accept higher skill migration, mm. are less accepting of lower skill migration, because in their head that's worse, but seem to recognise when you put it to them that it's very useful as well. Yep. Okay. Well, social care is different. If you want popular migration in this country, it's, um, it's the NHS, um, it's students, and it's social care workers. And then people will also take uh, lawyers and bankers who want to pay the 40p tax, you know, because, I mean, in the end you do. But the, the social care migrants are more popular than, 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 the, than the bankers. But what, what's happening here, and then fruit picking is different from other low and medium skilled jobs. Nobody thinks they want their kids to be fruit pickers. Nick Robinson used a lot of our research and he went around Mansfield with sort of you know happy family style playing cards and basically people, people will refuse the unskilled generic worker without a job and then definitely take the fruit picker and definitely take the social care worker and then you hit the problem where people are torn between the usefulness of someone doing that job in building and trust in that sector uh, sandwich shops, hotels, etc., to be interested in employing migrants fairly and having jobs for everyone. So it's a training and skills issue. But the reason people say, well, I can think about that, is they'll obviously say, and this is apart from the issue about the trade-off, people can obviously say, well, if I designed a sensible system, why wouldn't I, why wouldn't I take the people that were good for us? And the social care workers are definitely in. Business does not have the reputation 
especially locally, in lots of these sectors, that what's good for the business is good for the place the business operates. If that is true, people will support that business so, wanting, wanting the workers. So if we draw on what you said about Chesterfield and the mentioning of those two big corporations, are we drilling down to... It's quite, it gets quite intriguing, this. There's a very specific quality and type of what is deemed to be low-skilled, but it's probably not low-skilled migration, which is agency workers going into factories and processing centres and logistical centres, which is visible it, uh, which is visible in small towns all over the UK in a way that maybe wasn't there 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, if you... Is, if, I mean, yeah. is that, is that yeah. too much, much yeah, simplification? Am I... So employers haven't known that local integration matters is part of their job, um, and they have preached sort of GDP and so on. If yeah. you had a seasonal agriculture scheme where employers were felt to be responsible for the housing, people would like it. And if you had a seasonal agriculture support scheme where that wasn't the case, people would dislike it. But employers have just not understood their responsibilities. If you have migration at work and there's contact between Poles and British people at work and the school gate, migration will be popular. If you have two businesses side by side or a single business where Brits are in that bit and Poles are in the workhouse, then people will actually dislike the experience of work. Employers have simply not understood that they are shaping the attitudes and perceptions that people have about their lived experience of change in their areas. Can okay. I, sorry, can I say on that? Sorry. I think I think employers um, have have understood, and they that they know that all migrant workforces aren't popular. They also see segregation in their own workforces, where you know the poles all sit on one table, the Brits all sit on the other. It's just they haven't done much mm. about it, and it's also not something that they speak publicly about because they they haven't felt the need to explain themselves. I saw no evidence before the referendum that businesses thought that that kind of thing that they were doing was affecting the public concern for immigration. They, so, they went on facts. And if they do it now, it would be brilliant. But that, that is how you will build so, it. So to be clear, let's think this through. So to be clear, would the immigration white paper proposals uh, restrict that thing we've honed in on, that, that type of migration? No. <laughs> it would be worse. I mean, it would be worse. It's basically, it's basically faster churn, more temporary work, lower productivity, next-year neighbours are different okay. to last-year neighbours, yeah. and no perception that businesses can work with that. I mean, the only place it would work, which is agriculture, is getting its own seasonal scheme. It's just not the answer to pragmatic and controlled low-skilled immigration. Okay. Uh, last, last point, which I think is quite interesting, just in terms of the, the, the path that we're going down in, in, here about this... You know, what do people specifically, and the paradoxes. So during the referendum, I, you know, I remember I uh, interviewed the leader of the opposition a few times, and he was always a bit stumped, obviously, about this issue about Labour voters and freedom of movement. Mm. But he would forever, and it was almost like there would be warnings in my ear, he, wait, Corbyn's going to start talking about the posted workers directive. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, this is a filibuster, we need to stop him. You know, it was, it was a bit of a running joke. Yeah. But actually, is, does this, is, this the, is this the same thing? Is it, it, does, it, 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 seems, it seems to be f the same area, at least they're claiming to try to target, which is yeah. en masse moves into factories in small towns using freedom of movement. Yeah, I mean, look, just one thing, going back to your the previous point, one thing you've got to bear in mind from a public attitude point of view is that there is a proxy element to that focus on higher skills from a public attitude perspective. So we've always been top. When you look around Europe, we've been the country that's put most emphasis on higher skills for years and years. Again, been studying the, the, the evolution of these sorts of things for years. Uh, and that is partly about the skill, but that is partly also a signal about volume, because by definition, higher skills are going to be uh, fewer people. So people do care about the skills levels, but they also care about that as a single a signal of control in that. And I think the problem that we'll have in trying to interpret what the people want in that is that they live in the micro, uh, but these effects are on the macro, so they cannot make that leap. It's very, very difficult for any of us to make that leap from the, the micro effects that you see day to day compared to what does it actually mean for the economy and the macro elements of that. And this, the second element to that is, and this is more for the evolution for the future, is uh, we're terrible at uh, distinguishing between stock and flow on these things. So the extent to which we will notice any change as a result of the types of any of these sort of initiatives that come through are going to be really hard for people to pick up on. Um, this is not, when you, do, when you look at lots of the polling on this, that there are big segments of the population that think that it's not about a little bit more control, it is about reversal 
of uh, immigration trends. When they, when they, what they are looking for in terms of this is not just little tweaks around the edges. It is uh, quite significant changes. So that, that stock flow issue is really important. But the, the one, the thing that I'm surprised hasn't come out more, going back to your social care point, is uh, lots and lots of the polling showing that people very, very sensitive to the pressures on the NHS from this. So the, the, the big thing, the thing, the fulcrum issue is the extent to which this is going to, anything that's, that's happening now and anything that happens as a result of the white paper, if, if that is linked by NHS management and leaders to things that are happening in the NHS, then that can shift. You're talking uh, about as workers rather than as consumers. Workers, as industry. workers, as consumers. Okay. So, so that kind of focus on workforce type stuff, the, the, that, and I'm surprised we haven't seen more over winter pressures and the links between those types of things, but that may well come, and that type of thing will have much more impact on macro attitudes than what happens with Amazon or whatever else in individual areas for people. But, I mean, my, my sort of political economy thesis here is that that migration was more visible uh, in a first-past-the-post democracy with constituencies. It mattered because it was small, visible, but in lots of different constituencies, which may be why it expresses itself politically more. Um, Rob, do you want to come in and we should probably uh, take some questions? Yeah, yeah. Ju just on that point, the, the one cautionary note I would make is that uh, ever since the first wave of migration to Britain in the 50s and 60s, uh, political scientists of various stripes have tried to find evidence for these kind of local, localised electoral effects. This thesis that this place is affected by migration in this way, so these people will vote differently. Yeah. And it's a bit like hunting the snark. You never find it. The effects are always nationalised, and they're always about the general kinds of people. Yeah. So you take the same voter and take him out of Bolsover and put him into Basingstoke or put him into Guildford, he behaves the same way, which, which is a reason for some degree of qualified caution about the degree to which this is driven by just local things. There is a very strong nationalised value-based element. And obviously the local stuff feeds up into it, but we shouldn't be overstating the case to which there's some sort of simple feed-through from a particular local factory to how people end up voting, because okay. there isn't. Let's, uh, let's take some questions. Sorry, uh, do we have the mics? Where are the mics? Okay, uh, just let's take three or four questions. Uh, gentleman at the back, Gent uh, two gentlemen there. Thank you. Hi. Uh, Tony Halmos from King's College London. Um, can I ask, uh, it's probably a difficult question, but it needs to be asked. Uh, you've skirted around it. Do, is there any polling information that gets to the, the, the bottom of how much of the attitudes towards immigration is basically racism, pure and simple? I mean, obviously, we all know, unless we're blind that some of it must be but is there any factual information that it's difficult you can't ask the question are you racist obviously the question is how, how do you how you are, the pro <laughs> are the proxy questions and if so what do the numbers show thanks tony a couple of questions here uh, just here yeah just ask a question about whether the issue of class and the prejudice against class is being played out here you could say english people like the upper class go a lot of money so we're quite happy for them to come Middle class people, they're the skilled people, so we're using skill as a proxy for people who are more cultured, more knowledgeable, whatever. And then, of course, there's a prejudice against lower class people who are on benefits and committing crime and all these other sorts of things. So we're having a conversation which is depending on people's attitudes towards class, prejudices towards class that's being worked out in this way. Is there any evidence to say that could be how people are viewing it? Uh, I mean, just pass it forward to the gentleman there, and there's a lady over there with glasses yeah. as well. Uh, yeah. Just, just behind you, over behind, behind. Yeah, yeah so. a very interesting debate. But as a Leave voter, I have to say, a whole immigration, a EU immigration thing, is an utter red herring. I say that my wife is Polish, but um, the reality is, um, is most people actually want to control immigration in this country that I've ever spoken to, both personally or not personally are concerned about non-EU immigration, which is not affected by our relationship to free movement of the EU, because it's a completely separate point. But they mask it by saying we're concerned about immigration from the EU because it's socially acceptable, and this comes back to what the first gentleman said, because the immigrants from Europe are white, and therefore you can say I don't want too many immigrants from Europe and get away with saying that. And actually... Why I say it's a red herring to the EU debate is because controlling non-EU immigration has nothing to do with the EU by free movement at all. And I'm well aware of that as a Leave voter. 
because they raised that point. OK, and just the lady over there. Hello, Catherine Pribble, oh, okay. German uh, media. I'm just wondering how much is it related that, like, the positive shift towards immigration in the public that Theresa May sort of obsessed with immigration and took that matter off the table right from the start? And would it make now a big difference if someone took over and said, you know what, immigration is not the matter anymore, we just keep um, freedom of movement? Very interesting. Okay, well, let's, l l let's take those. Um, who wants to, to go on the racism question and the Leave voters want yeah, to control? Yeah, the, the, the racism question, well, I mean, it, it, from an academic perspective, I'm kind of glad that, that you asked that because it's the very first question I tried to answer as a researcher many years ago and still been trying to answer it ever since. Um, oh, sorry. Um, so it's complicated is the short answer. Um, Views about race and national identity, viewing ancestry as a predictor, you know, an important qualification for being British and so on, these all tend to predict very negative views on immigration. That is true. On the other hand, if you are to run an experiment, and I've done a number of them, and there have been several others done across the whole of Europe, where you present people with a, an imaginary immigrant, and the only thing that you randomly vary, just like doing an experiment for a pharmaceutical company, you get the red pill or the blue pill, you don't know what's in it. The only thing you randomly vary is whether the immigrant comes from Pakistan or Poland. There's no difference. The people who get the Pakistani immigrant react the same as the people who get the Polish immigrant. There's no more support for the white immigrants than the non-white immigrants, which I think also speaks to the point that the third uh, questioner made, which is that a lot of this is actually masked anxiety about non-white immigration. But it's in one sense yes, in another sense no. In the sense that a lot of opposition to immigration is actually opposition to broader cultural change, to a shift to a more diverse society, that is true. In the sense that opponents of immigration are specifically discriminating against non-white migrants, there's much less evidence for that. Um, when we try and hone in on that specific element, we, we just don't find it very often. So it's a mixed picture in that respect. There clearly is a segment of the public that doesn't like identity change, that doesn't like the shift to a diverse society, that doesn't like the growth of minorities, and, and much of their opposition to immigration will come from that. There's much less evidence that there's a substantial chunk of the public that discriminates between migrants on those grounds. Whereas if we run the same experiments with skill differences, the differences in response are really very big. Uh, and then on that point about are people sort of saying that they're not worried about immigration because they think May's taken it off the table? Again, that's kind of tricky to answer. When we look at the British election study data and we ask people what change they anticipate to happen as a result of Brexit, we would expect if that was true that they would say that immigration will come down a lot because that's what Mrs May keeps saying she's going to do. They don't on the whole. Uh, they tend to say that migration will fall a little bit. Uh, but not a lot. Uh, that doesn't mean that your premise is wrong. It could be that a little bit is all that they need and they think May's anyone is even going to deliver a little bit. But it does suggest that, you know, it's, that there's a potential for them to be disappointed in that expectation and still keep these, these uh, views for other reasons. Thanks, uh, Rob. Uh, Bobby, uh, one little thing. I, I found in my, with a TV camera, as a TV reporter, you have to get in and speak to people. And I found this quite interesting thing, and I'm from Manchester myself, which was that, people were, it wasn't racism, but people did have a discomfort with the grand metropolis of, uh, metropolis of London and felt it was very different and didn't want their town to become like London, which I thought was quite interesting. Anyway. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, actually, that links to that second question, which is, it's about how these things interact with class and with how your views about metropolitan versus these kind of, which is a great question, that, that point about that was the focus of the first panel, which is about these identity divisions that we've got now are not just about immigrant versus non-immigrant, not just about high and low class. It's about the interactions between those. I think that that is a key part of that. And particularly around immigration, that goes back to the point that very much depends on the image, the mental image you have in mind about the particular immigrant you're talking about when you're answering these types of questions. I mean, uh, it's called, in, in the kind of academic work, that imagined immigration that we've got in our, our minds is really important in framing how we react to it. There is no one 
mental image of it, and you get very different responses depending on how you frame it, as you see in Rob's work. So that's why, that's why we need to be cautious. And it's not like stupidity on people's part. It is because these are complex interactions about different types of identity, where class is still really important. Uh, just uh, And then my final point for me on that positive uh, shift as a result of taking it off the table. I mean, we asked a question which just asked people who had become more positive over time, uh, why have you become more positive? And we, we just asked them whether it was broadly something to do with uh, reassurance that uh, the numbers are either coming down or they will come down, or was it something to do with regret that now uh, we are leaving European Union, uh, we've actually realised more that uh, what we get from immigration, and we, we've got an element of regret about that. So you've got two, big, two broad possible explanations. It's reassurance that the numbers are coming down or, and will come down, or it's regret that now actually we realise that we need more immigration than we think. And just like everything else in this sort of debate, it splits that population half in half. So you've got half of people saying, yes, it's actually Actually, I'm, I'm more positive about immigration because I feel I can say that because I, I know it's going to be more under control. And half of that population who've got a more positive shift uh, saying that it's actually, no, I, I kind of realise now that we need immigrants. So uh, the that theme was the whole, of the, That was the whole population, not just leave, leave you know, This was just the whole population, not just Remainers or Leavers. This is people who've actually said, over the, since the referendum, I've become, I've become more positive about immigration. It's partly because of control, because it's off the table or it's under control, as you say. And it's part because actually, now I realise the value of immigration. And I think that just, it's a very simple questioning approach, but I think it chimes with what we all think and with the divisions that we've seen all morning in this. It splits let, the country. Let me up. put that very specific thing to you, Sander, Catherine's question, which is, in a way, another way to look at it, is Theresa May targeting something and creating red lines out of an issue which is to some degree resolving itself, either through the market and the fiscal incentives and the sterling incentives and the fact that EU migration has fallen, or if she didn't address it, would it just pop up again? I think it's likely to reheat and repolarise, for sure, if you held European elections in May, for example, as you prepared to hold another referendum. Um, and then you will get a structured, polarised debate where it will actually be in the interests of the Conservative Party to mobilise, and, and to parties to their right, Nigel Farage, to mobilise that large minority, and for the Liberal Democrats and the Greens to mobilise that large minority, etc. And if you... Otherwise, it might... Be, the vote felt very powerful to people um, who voted for it. So there was a, a lack... Of, uh, if you had a no control, suddenly it felt very controlled, and then other people changed for other reasons. The process since has felt very unpower, unempowering to everybody on all sides. Well, let's say something about racism uh, and racism in this. It's a very important question. I mean, the other thing we spent a lot last year doing was hanging around Wolverhampton, Birmingham, and Dudley asking people about race over 50 years and what they thought about Enoch Powell now. And it was fantastically interesting how rich a conversation you had from older people in the West Midlands about how the place had changed and how nobody under 40 had a clue who Enoch Powell was. And were more worried, were more worried about prejudice now because they weren't like, oh, it was much more racist in the 1970s, you should have seen it. They were just like, I want it sorted out now. Um, it's a much less racist society than when I had a season ticket at Goodison Park when I was um, mm. 11. And yet, it's still, there's a lot of racism. A tenth of people say yes to overtly racist things. The problem is that the, that the pro-migration, pro-main group has a reputation for calling anything racist before they've worked out where the boundary is, and that becomes hard to police, to police racism. So, so um, it's a question of if you can't say what is permitted in the debate about immigration and integration, you can't police the boundary on race. And then the other thing that is very broad, so the people who are racist say, they don't want to say they're racist, they'll say, I've only got a problem with the Muslims, but can I tell you about all the groups I like? Like, but that is coming from quite a racist place. That that is not that is not mostly in the areas of highest diversity. That is not going on in inner city Birmingham and Bradford, but it is very, very strong elsewhere in Yorkshire. Um, it was, we found it very strong in Kettering, looking at Birmingham, in Basildon, looking at Tower Hamlets, places where change is visible in places you know 15 miles away and you don't have any contact mm. are very, very wide. But that very, that very toxic group is very angry and very mobilised. And if attitudes get softer and we make softer decisions, they will be more angry. But that doesn't mean that most people agree with them. Very interesting. Heather? Um, just briefly, um, on, the, on, the, on the role of racism. So um, our focus groups, we were very much looking at the economic impacts of migration. And, and we found people's concerns were very much around contribution and uh, use of services and so on. Um, so, and cultural concerns didn't arise very much. And um, so... 
Um, some people said to us, oh, that's because you were focusing on, on economics, but actually cultural concerns are much, much more important in the debate about immigration than, than you've given credit for in, in your research. But I think actually... Um, People were not, um, were not shy about expressing their concerns about the cultural impacts of immigration, but they expressed them in relation to non-EU migration and very largely in relation to settled communities, in particular Muslims, as, as Sonda said. So I'm sure, to, you know, to some degree, our, our focus groups were, were very similar in, in that respect. Um, so the cultural concerns don't seem to rise so much in, term, in relation to EU migration. I think some of that is because genuinely a lot, or some, at least some of EU migration, is mobility, and people don't necessarily think that people are going to stay forever. They see them coming and going. They'd probably like them to, to come and go a bit less than they do, in that Sunder said that churn is not, um, is not welcomed. Um, but even so, I think that the cultural impacts of EU migration, are, and there's, there's not so much uh, concern about that. Somebody asked a question about the sort of, is, is this, the high skilled, low skill thing, a prejudice against um, lower class people. You know, we're talking about quality people here. And I, I think um, what is going on there is that we're really talking about contribution and that um, people have a quite a kind of transactional attitude around migration and they want it to benefit the UK. They've heard that, although well, they don't always believe it, but they've heard that it benefits the UK. And, um, and so they think a higher skilled person is going to be contributing more and um, a lower skilled person less. But the people that they're really worried about are not, uh, are not people who are working. It's people who they see is coming over here to claim benefits, which I've said people think, uh, I think something like 25 percent of people think that that's a major driver and also people who are coming over here to commit crime. And benefit claimants and criminals are very strongly associated in, in the public's mind um, with, with migrants. I mean, not necessarily with EU, migra EU migrants, but migration um, in general. So I think that that's where um, the, the quality aspect comes in. So I don't actually really think it's a kind of snobbery about, you know, middle class people versus working class people. I think if someone's seen to actually potentially make a contribution that is needed, um, then, then they're seen to, that's seen as a positive thing. Right, I'm sorry about this. I, I, I'm, I'm over time. So unless someone says we've got another couple of minutes, is anybody, one of the organisers here? Um, I think we're a bit over time, so I'm going to have to wrap that up. And who would have known? I think the biggest lesson and best anecdote of this panel, forgive me, <laughs> is this, uh, and the lesson being who knows what the public policy implications are of ideas from 20 years ago, is that if you have military curfews, you get baby booms <laughs> and exodus of your young population in 20 years' time. Um, so who knows what the implications of all the ideas we've been chewing over and that are so happily, happily percolating through the political <laughs> system at the moment. Who knows what they will be if they ever happen. Thank you very much. <laughs>